Please stand. Most worshipful Grandmaster, your officers, your officers past and present, and hopefully those for the future. This evening's lecture is rather significant and give me quite a lot of ple uh, pleasure as well as displeasure having to give it. Why the pleasure is very understandable. Why the displeasure may be the problem. But the problem comes not from the persons receiving it. It comes from the manner in which they receive the information for what they have. I brought with me, as you see right here, two basic books. They are books from Egypt. When these books were written, there was no God by the name of Jehovah, no God by the name of Jesus, and no God by the name of Allah. Yet African people were here in this world. And I'm going to speak on data going back before Adam and Eve. There were no Adam and no Eve from whence I'm going to speak and the world was here. There was no book of Genesis because the Hebrews give us what is called the five books of Moses. And the first Hebrew was a man called Abraham. Abraham was born in the city of Ur in Chaldea. It is spelled U-R, Ur, and Chaldea is spelled C-H-A-L-D-E-A. He was born around 1700 before the common era, as you may say, before Christ. That means that his mother was here. I said he was born from a woman and a man, meaning both parents preceded him. And their parents and ancestors before them preceded him. He was born after there were already a nation and many other nations that were neighbors to that nation and there was no state by the name of Israel yet. So I give just slight background to start so that you have no problem in understanding that Solomon wasn't born yet. It would be, Abraham was born, according to them, around the 14th dynasty. That's us, the African. We had dynasties all along the Nile. I don't know of an Asian dynasty, nor of the European dynasty, but I can assure you there were African dynasties. Thus, if we had dynasties, we had pharaohs. As a matter of fact, we had the first one. And we had them until the Asians came while we were in our 14th dynasty, the first group of Asians to come to conquer any part in the continent we call today Africa, we had dynasties. In and around, the first dynasty, we were still without an organization we today call Masonic, by whatever reason or meaning. 
And in the third dynasty, however, we started an organization to continue the building of structures in Egypt. And may I remind you that Egypt is the last nation built along the Nile, not the first, as some of us uh, speak. The first nation built along the Nile started in Central East Africa. Today we call it Uganda. It was part of the Bokonga Kingdom. And I'm going back rather far because I'm going before the first dynasty, meaning I'm going before 4,100 years before the Christian era. Solomon, on the other hand, doesn't come in before 1,000 BC, and that would be around the time when Greece came into existence. That means the first European nation. I, I hope you will uh, take note of that fact. The first European nation in history is Greece and Rome. That is providing you want to accept that a wolf named Remus uh, raised two people, and those people created a state. I mean, if all those kind of things we accept in the Harvard and places like that, and it's okay. But when I speak anything serious, it's difficult because they come from Africa. Now, these positions I'm laying down so that we have no difficulty when I start to deal more directly in what we call the Masonic literature. It would seem to me that the history states that the first literary person in all of Europe, the first one to have written anything for publication so that others can read it, would be a Greek. And that Greek would read, uh, write two pieces of literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The first two books written any place in Europe. And the nation was called Greece, and the author was Homer. There is, I will put my life on it, no other work written in Europe prior to that, to those two books, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And Homer said in the Odyssey, even the gods that Greece adopted came from Ethiopia. And there's no Ethiopia anyway in the continent of Europe. No Asia. There's one in Africa, East Africa to be exact. I know I was born there. <laughs> now, that as it is, we need to move a little, but I just thought that it was necessary to establish this point. So we got two most important things in what I'm going to speak about tonight. I am not speaking tonight when I mention the name Solomon and the Masonic lodges or anything dealing with ma ma Masons, dealing with Asia or Africa or vice versa. I am dealing with Solomon as spoken about by England, not by Asia, or by Africa. Let me make it clearer. A part of an island related to Europe, otherwise in ancient time called Angloland, which is today called England, with a combination of Ireland and Scotland, this land took upon itself after finding some documents in Egypt, a part of Africa, Northeast Africa, they translate those documents for the purpose of their own. And out of that, using with what was developed as the Holy Grail in an attempt to conquer part of Asia and part of Northeast Africa, in that they continued on, adopted certain teachings, and did call that today what we know as the Masonic principles. 
those principles were attributed to a condition dealing with one of the head of the Hebrew government, one man by the name of Solomon. The same Solomon, it is said, that had a relationship with the great queen of Ethiopia by the name of Makeda, which you commonly speak of here as the queen of Sheba. But may I remind you, Sheba is in Asia. She was the queen of Aksum, because what is called today Ethiopia was then called Aksum. Ethiopia is a name given us by the Greeks, not by ourselves, as we have had many other names. So she was the queen of Aksum, but the empress of Saba. Let me make it clear again. When a queen has a land, she's the head of that land. When that land under her captures another king or another country, another land, she then becomes empress of the land she captured. And that's the, I need that qualification because it become very important in my discussions. There we have now, to, for the sake of time, we must make some things very clear. Why did we need any kind of organization, whether it be from one or the next? Number one, something had transpired in what is today called Egypt, from the Greek Egypticus and the English Egypt, the Africans Tameri, and other people have different names they call Egypt, especially the Jewish Mizran and so forth. What had transpired is that in the third dynasty, a revolution took place, and the revolution was something that has put the world on fire ever since, the building of stone structures. In the third dynasty, under the pharaoh Zuza, D-J-O-S-E-R, otherwise called Sir S-E-R, which the Greeks could not pronounce and they called Duza, D-Z-O-R. A man, this man, a multi-genius, a man of many, many talents by the name of Imhotep. Most of us knew him first as a physician. And we said that he was the first physician when in fact we have still found out that his mother was a physician and his two sisters were physicians and many other people before him were physicians. But nevertheless, that would be enough for the point. Imhotep didn't want his pharaoh to be buried as other pharaohs before him because the place in which they were buried soon rotted and there was no proper way in which you could protect what was left. Thus, he pondered consistent, consistently for a place to bury the pharaoh and the method in which to it, and finally came up with the use of stone, masonry. And that is where the aspect of the word masonry is going to start. Imhotep died, died. In the third dynasty, around 2785 before the common era. Solomon was born not before 1000 BC. So Imhotep was over 1200 years older than Solomon. And he's going to introduce what we today call Freemasonry. 1200 years before Solomon. So if Solomon is the father of Freemasonry, what would you call in Hotep? The grandmother? <laughs> no, but I understand. I understand because the European told us. And if they told us, it got to be right. <laughs> Irrespective of the data that we deal with. Let us continue. So Imhotep designed a pyramid, but he did not start out to design the pyramid, but to design a bench, a box, a mastaba. 
Mastaba is an Arabic word. The Arabs weren't there yet, by the way. I'm just using the term that is used. The Arabs are going to come way, way later. There's no Arabs in the world yet. The word don't exist. Inhotep continued and built one mastaba, two mastaba, and three, seven of them, one each smaller than the, than the other. It looks like a wedding cake. Today, the step pyramid at Saqqara is still there to the present time that you can go anytime to Egypt and see as so many other of the 91 pyramids covering over an area of 10 miles square. So it is that particular pyramid that we are interested at this particular point. May I remind you, there is no God at this time by the name of Jehovah. None named Jesus and none named Allah. I must remind you because it's very important that your ancestors worship different gods and goddesses, none by that name. They're not going to do that until they are in the 14th dynasty when the Hebrew would come to us, Avram, or Avraham, or Ibrahim, as you may say, would come and then introduce his concept of a deity when we go back to the book of Genesis after worshiping the goddess Hathor, or Het Heru, the goddess that looks like a cow with woman's ears, goddess Het Heru. Now, you recall that when Abraham is uh, having to make the uh, sacrifice with his son, uh, offered to make the sacrifice with his son, and that was the goddess, the cow goddess that they showed then. Uh, it was the cow goddess that the Ethiopians, uh, the Nubians, and the Egyptians carried with them when they went all the way to India, struggling. When they conquered the, the, the city where Abraham was born, they conquered that city and changed the name from uh, Chaldea to Pont. It is at that time, however, that Imhotep gathered around him the men who worked on the pyramids of Saqqara and given each of them respective name based upon the jobs in which they did. They were the master mason and I would in some of these cases, my brothers, I will not define the relationship of certain titles to a certain job because you will understand why I am not doing it. Uh, because at this moment, we will not speak on each other on what level or the other level, or who's right or who's wrong. We're not going to speak of that. We're speaking on another, another thing altogether. In so doing, the brothers were placed and certain symbols or tokens, as you may call them, were placed on the individual. Men were given the certain des designation and responsibility which they had. But something was more important than that also. Since the ancient Egyptians, as I'm using the term you know, had to be re reminded as they reminded themselves from whence they came, any organization they had had to re relate back to the central position that they came from, the beginning of the Nile. That is why one of the major papyrus still states, we came from the beginning of the Nile, where God happy dwells at the foothills of the mountain of the moon. Let us dissect this. We came from the beginning of the Nile there, many places at the beginning of the Nile. The furthest point south will be in Uganda, the White Nile. By the way, since there is no um, Lake Victoria, they may have one in England, but they don't have one have anyone in Africa. So we will go back to the original name, Mwanja Nuanza. And we will call it that because that's what the African name it. The fact that they came from England and name it what they want don't mean we have to follow it. <laughs> when they're gone, we go back to what is ours. So, Mwanza Nyanza. And they said 
from the beginning of the Nile. But there is another part of the beginning of the Nile. It starts in Ethiopia, Lake Tana, and it's called the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile and the White Nile flowing down north, not down south. We're not here. We are in Africa. And north is the lowland, south is the highland, and it flows down north and merge, both rivers merge at a place called Khartoum in Sudan. A third body of water out of the Ethiopian highland called the Atbara River flows down north and merges with the two bodies of water that had merged already and formed just the plain Nile, which continues north into ancient Nubia, from there into ancient Egypt, through Egypt and empties in the Great Sea, now called the Mediterranean. So in his description, of where we, he came from, Ethiopians, Egyptians, Nubians, and others, he make that very clear. But in making that clear, in all of the stations they made, and speaking about certain very important traditions of the trilogy, it was necessary to make those stations very clear. Thus, when some of you talk about going to take bones out of the earth at a certain place across the fence in Ethiopia, you must remember that the three men of the three names from, were not from Ethiopia, but had gone to Ethiopia to evade the behavior as some wrongful brothers. <laughs> when they went to Ethiopia, they did not go to Ethiopia with the Western title of 33 degrees symbolic of the life of Jesus. Now let's face it, where the 33 comes from. <laughs> A circle is not made of 33 degrees. It is made of 360 degrees, and each quarter of the circle is 90. And you will have to go to Meroe to go to the second quarter. You see, at home we are not allowed to put an electric cord in the socket and then walk on the produce of that electric cord. We have to go to Meroe, a place called Meroe. And heaven knows it's hell to get to Meroe. <laughs> because you're going there, you're going there in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a British Jeep, and there is no road. When you drive back, five minutes the track is gone, and you've got to know I have to carry somebody who knows just where to go. Otherwise, you could be there driving around for, for a few days, or maybe forever. And you then go and you walk on the hot grass. And I'm saying hot grass to make you feel good, but there's no grass there. You're going to walk on the hot sun. And when you have walked enough, I've uh, got elder men in here, when you've walked enough and are almost exhausted, then somebody sees one of the 44 pyramids in Sudan. Nobody tells us there's Sudan, right? When last did you hear there are pyramids in Sudan? Take my words, there are. I've been there a number of times, and I've needed the, the podiatrist when I return. <laughs> but there is that hot sand in which you walk. There was no Solomon when they built the first pyramid. There was no Abraham, the first of the Hebrews. And I'm not saying that for joke, I was born in Hebrew religion, and I let it go. Because you cannot tell me lies, and expect me to continue to lie because I'm a member of the group. 
it is incumbent upon me to change the lie, if it's possible, or get rid of it completely. Because the integrity of the African person is that of the deity. I said before that it's going to be difficult to give this lecture. It is difficult because I am speaking to a house of my people. And I understand the significance of the words I used. So I need to document a little further. I am quite respectful of the men, the honorable men, the men whose body and soul went on, his car and his back went on to the next world, who laid down his life for me and others like me, when he took upon himself a right passed on from the British crown to him who had come from Barbados to Philadelphia, and then de dealt with others included Washington, who I have no respect for. You see, when a man exchanged any member of my family for molasses, for their being slaves, how can I respect them? You don't know if a European having respect for Hitler. Now, how should I have respect for a man that treat me like Hitler treat people? Unless you don't have any respect for me, yourself. So I don't have a respect, but I'm talking about a man that you pay honor, most reverent honor in this institution. I'm speaking as this brother in context for what he meant for me and others. I have read carefully his background, his background both in war and outside of war, and his relationship in the United States of America, or what turned out to be the United States of America. Thus, I understand that man. I understand that he was trying to do the best. It put me in the mind of when uh, the brother from the Virgin Islands came here, uh, Dr. Uh, Shum, uh, not Shum, Dr. Uh, oh, Blyden, Dr. Edward Widmer Blyden. When Dr. Blyden came here to, to Atlanta, ATC, the religious institution there, you should read what Dr. Blyden said, and you would vomit. You would get sick. But you have to remember that Dr. Blyden had just come here from the United States, I mean, for the, what was the Danish Virgin Islands, which later became the United States Virgin Islands, and he was repeating what he had been taught without any other experience. You read the same Dr. Blyden's work a number of years later when he had stopped being the president of the College of Liberia, and you see two different people completely. In the first case, you have seen a little slave with a slave mind. In the second case, you have seen the slave who had dropped his slavishness become an African man and spoke as an African man. It is Blyden is the one that, who had given us the term, what does the, Africa, what does the um, European have that the African ha woman have to take as a model for her beauty? The question, of course, was answered itself, and the answer was nothing. Back to the Masonic principle. It is in this context then that Imhotep laid down the value of the Masonic principles. Masonic principles. And the first principle he dealt with is the concept of the one and only deity. We talk about the one and only deity in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and there still is no one and only deity. We said the God above all other gods. For I am a jealous God. 
Akhenaten said, there is only one God. And his name is Aten. One said, there's only one God. The other one said, I am above all the others. Judaism and Christianity, if I'm wrong, correct me. But we can't deal with it because it isn't, hasn't been endorsed by our European masters yet. <laughs> Probably it will never be too late. Someday we will all recognize uh, a God. Because if, we, if I brought a picture of God here and tried to put him on this hall, I may not be lucky because he may not be the right color. <laughs> based upon some that I've seen. But when Imhotep decided to inaugurate the first lodge, lodge, L-O-D-G-E, he made a distinction between the church or the synagogue, or we'll call it what the, the house of worship. That would be the best thing to call it so there'd be no difficulty. He made the distinction between that and the lodge. And when he adopted what they call the village lodge, the city lodge, the lower lodge, not the one attached to the, to the, to the, uh, uh, the, the pyramid, because that one was for the operation of the human body, to remove the intestines and other aspects, including the heart soul, and to put them in the canopic jaws. The placing of those things in the compact jaws was part of the Masonic order, part of the work in which a Mason had to perform. I ask you, gentlemen, do you perform this work? No. We don't any longer because England, the English House and the Charter House said that we were not interested in the actual act. Up until the death of Selassie, to be a member of the Ethiopian inner house, those who were in the inner house had to perform this act as well as their ladies here, so as well as certain other things. <laughs> I know you would, you would bear with me understanding the circumstances under which I have to speak. But anyhow, those uh, traditions in which were being established at that particular time were held and carried on. Different stations or different applications were used. And in them, they then adjusted this book. What I have before me here is an original copy of the book To testify was the duty of a man that should he tell not the truth, he would be demanded. <laughs> but then I realized that everything has become symbolic in the West. What we are doing is symbolism. Nobody, anybody knows. People aren't even afraid anymore to come to you on the end of a what, or come drawn, or anything like that. Because 
they already know nobody's going to be hurt. <laughs> they will go and lay in the coffin next to you. Because, as a matter of fact, nobody goes in the coffin with anybody these days. <laughs> and it, it is said, it's read, but it's never carried out. Everything is symbolic. We have nothing, thank you, sir, yes. that we use in realism. The words then, uh, why is it that uh, Solomon has been given the dubious responsibility of carrying this on his head a thousand and add years later when this were ready in its full strength? Because around Solomon, they could build they, the most <coughs> logical person for them to have carry the torch over and transfer it to Israel. But if you read the, Egypt, the Ethiopian account of Makeda, the queen of Sheba, visit to Solomon, then you would understand that it could not have been since in fact she went to Israel when Ethiopia was the strongest nation in the world. And she went with a delegation, gave him her body, and took what the little deed did have, took that away, plus a promise that when her son, Makeda, uh, 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 came older, Makeda's son come older, Abna Hakim the first, which you call Melanik the first, his name is Abna Hakim, that he will return to Israel received the ring, the, go the golden ring, and returned back to Ethiopia, and then uh, he would return with the golden whatever. Now that, uh, that is um, a mystery because it isn't in Ethiopia and it isn't nowhere, but we know what is, is, the, is called in, in Egypt the golden box for the confined one. See, when we take religion, and use religion as an aggressor one to the other, we are bound to get the cut off. Because then we don't speak to each other, we don't share with each other, and therefore information breaks off and we could pass anything. And that is what has happened to us uh, during this period of time. So the Queen of Sheba returning with Yakba. When Yakba brought back the brothers with him, when now they call us Falasha, but we call ourselves Better Israel. Uh, when they brought back the fellows with them and the uh, Ethiopian chronicles of the kings, the uh, Kebra Negats, when the Kebra Negats was adjusted to suit of recent time, then you could see uh, what all that all stood for. From then on, it was necessary to use the European system of passing identification by paper, by templates, by different things to say what one is. From then, it was necessary to remove the heavy requirement from seven degrees before you can go out and call yourself a man at three degrees. You had to come in at seven. I think the three-letter men still do that, the ad fellows still use the seven degrees. From then, you stop burying as you are born as a baby in the crouched crouch position. Then you are buried straight out. From then, uh, you, you did not do such things uh, as we were talking about. The pass through the window, you did, it was not necessary to do when the brother passed away. He was not uh, compelled to pass him through the window and these different kind acts of things. I think it was Churchward, uh, Dr. Churchward, FPRS, in England, uh, who wrote uh, eight different books on Freemasonry. And he uh, placed down the different kinds of things that were changed to suit uh, this kind of work. As you know, that uh, Churchward asked for uh, acceptance in the lodge in Nubia and was turned down. Uh, that they was told that outside of the African people, there weren't no way in which they could give him that kind of honor. Thank heavens, they still maintain it. Uh, 
You see, when one looks at this, look what has happened. Remember that this remains strong. It remained the defender of certain things until the Roman Catholic wanted to thrust its muscle in Spain. And during the period of Inquisition, the Masons found themselves in a lot of difficulties with the Roman Church. Out of that, the superintendent of the order, as you know, the Jesuits are not members of the Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuits are members of the fighting arm that protects the church. The superintendent is the head of the Jesuits. And he had lived for many, many years in Spain until 25 years ago when he was carried to Rome to live, but not under, but in conjunction with the Roman church. And at that time, the Jesuits started. But again, we must go back to the history. Here we are again. Molina, Louis Molina. Louis Monero, a man whose parents went to Spain from Mauritania, an African carrying the name of a Moor, was one of the strongest Jesuits, one of the first of the three that formed the Jesuit order. And he moved first against the Protestants and others. There were a number of others, Jesuits, of course, from, from Mauritania and other places, but I needed to bring them up in your memory. The using of the seventh degree to bring a man into the entry, and that's as much as I can say about that right now, had not been carried away until much later. Of course, the three letter men pick it up. That's the three circles. And they instituted it, whereas symbolically, many of us still maintain uh, the three things. What becomes difficulty, however, is how does, how, how does ourselves as African brothers and sisters communicate with each other in letters which we could understand that the letters itself become ambiguous in that some is a four letter, some is a three letter, some is whatever the letters and we are able to sit down continuously speaking with our former master's children, asking to find a way in which we can work, but we don't sit down with our own. Now you explain it to me. Explain it that I can sit down with any European group and talk peace, talk and merger, but I can't sit down with one person looking like me and speak merger. Why? Years and years of induction as a slave. That mentality continues. And that means the world over, including at home in the motherland. Something must be wrong. Until that day when we can speak to each other. Like I told a man, he said to me, what are you? I said, a man. He said, no, what kind of a man? I said, a straight man. <laughs> because these days, these days you can't tell a man from a woman. And they told me it's a, pref a matter of preference of sex. And I said, no, my sex don't go that bad. That it's a matter of, but I had to make, I said, when I'm in Barbados, I'm a Barbadian. When I'm in Jamaica, I'm a Jamaican. When I'm in Virginia, I'm a Virginian. When I'm in uh, Ghana, I'm a Ghanaian. In other words, wherever there's a black person and I'm dealing with him, I am 
there of that black person wherever he is. That's what I am at the particular moment. I am like the people I am among my people. And if we can ever think of ourselves in that terms, then we will have no problem understanding that we need to go back. If we're going to call ourselves any such name, and you could examine it, when it uh, after the lecture and the question answer period, and you will see things that will, unfortunately, they have, it's all numbered the books, and they have no more, and they said they're never going to reprint it. Uh, but I just wanted you before the question answer period to, adea to, to deal with this. There is a greater extent to this lecture, and I know uh, the sisters are going to feel a little disdain. But sisters, if I came to a lecture given by someone for you, discussing your relationship to something this important, I will understand that I am not female. And because I am not female, there will be certain things you have been speak you are speaking about that I cannot get the intricacies because I'm not a woman. And I don't feel let down at all. Believe you me, just as you got a door and your bathroom, and you say, I can come in at certain times and I can't come in the other time, and I'm your husband. <laughs> just so I got the same door and my bathroom, and I'm your husband, and you can't come in. <laughs> So don't, it, it, everything I'm doing is for the benefit of both of us and the children. <laughs> but at times, you know, things have to be done in our own behalf. Bringing it down to an ending for a very strong question and answer period, and please don't be afraid of me and on, on Mondays or Tuesdays, I do not wear my gorilla head. Uh, it's the other times. And uh, you may ask me anything. If I do not know, I will tell you I do not know because there are quite a lot of things I don't know, more than I do know. And feel very glad of the fact that I don't know a lot of things because it's abnormal. Now, understanding all of this, my brothers, I am looking for the day when we can come together, regardless of where we are, over the world. And we will not have a mass organization, whether it carries three letters, four letters, or ten letters. We would have, I hope, a quality organization. We will go back, as our ancestors did, where we met, and discuss all of the disciplines of the world. There would be lectures in engineering, science, mathematics, the seven liberal arts, and so forth. Musicology, and so forth. We will have all that again. We will, the Masons would be a place where we can send our youngsters to learn science and engineering, and so forth, and so forth. Again, it will rejuvenate us to make us back in the men that we were in the past. And of course, we will use it for passing and crossing the ways. We will send our daughters, and we will certainly work very close with our sisters, not as extension of ourselves. Our sisters are entity unto themselves, but conjointly, they are us and we them. And together, we can create that which we had once more. My brothers and my sisters, I know I have taken quite a lot of time with you. And while I was speaking, I had to do a lot of thinking in the things I could say and the things I can't say. But I am sure that you have heard my speech. And in between some of the words, you notice that a lot of the things could not come the way they're supposed to. 
And so I held that for another time when we can meet head to head. I hold it from another time when we can get chest to chest, ear to, mouth to ear, and foot to foot. <laughs> and then, my brothers, we are not could change this around, we will change it around. I never once, and I'm not much, only just 76, but I recall when my father was, I'm gonna finish on this, when my father was 102 years old, quite a young fellow, <laughs> and he had broken his hip, he was blind because of diabetes, and he walked on a mango, he was an attorney, he walked on a mango, pea, mango uh, seed and slipped. It was freshly eaten. And he knew because my daughter, this particular daughter, my oldest girl was a physician and, she t and he had known that if you break your hip at that age, can't move around, pneumonia is gonna set in and within a week or two you'll be gone. And my father was telling jokes the doctor had tell him to stop smoking, and he said, for what? He said, I I'm going to die. <laughs> I mean, if I, just, if I could say something, then tell me don't smoke. But if I want to die just the same, let me smoke. So dad used to tell a lot of jokes, something similar to me, or I've similar to him. And my daughter went to him this day in the hospital, and she said to him, granddad, what were you trying to do while you broke your hip? He says, well, darling, you know that I'm blind, and I was trying to catch my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and so my daughter said, but well, granddad, what you, would, what you were gonna do? She says, he said to her, you are my grandchild, right? He said, yeah. And my son is your father, right? Now, how you think you got here? <laughs> <laughs> and so it got to my daughter, and she continued to laugh hilariously. And so she turned back to see the old man for the next punchline, and there he was with his face laughing. And that's what she covered, they covered it up, that he died the way he lived, always telling a joke. I hope I don't die this way, but I hope I say to you, peace. As we affectionately refer to him, that's our Dr. Ben. Yeah. Let's give him another hand. <laughs> okay. All right. You first. We, uh, Rainey, you have the. Uh, which mic are you going to use? You don't have one? Okay. <laughs> All right. At this, at this time, Dr. Ben is going to honor us by permitting us to ask questions, and he will answer. And since the Grand Master is here, I most certainly have to yield and permit him to ask the first question. Grand Master. Thank you. Dr. Ben, I have one question, which is broken into two parts. The first is, how old is masonry, and where 
did it start? Masonry officially started in Egypt with Inhotep. It started when Inhotep completed the pyramid as Saqqara and also the worship temple in the valley. And that will put us to about 43, 4200 before the common era, 4200 BC. It was approximately 3,200 years before the birth of Solomon. Yes, sir. Thank you, my brother. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Abdu Mangar. I'm from West Africa, Gambia. My name is Abdu Mangara from Gambia, West Africa. I'm Griyo. My family have 9,999 different family history. But I'm going to tell one thing here today. All my sisters with my brothers. This man is river. Everybody, if you want to know yourself, close to him, you get learning for him. Please. When he said, if you not get together, I'm not going to get the learning. What is this man, anyone in the United States, they don't know who's that. Africa today will not have more person like him. I have how many degrees, but my learning is black. That time they don't know right. Anything they learn for you, you're going to keep in your memory. He learned the book. Is it somebody here? Please, please, anyone close to him will get something for him. Thank you. I didn't hear. My question is in regard to the book of the dead and how, if there are any texts that we can use now and following what our ancestors have laid out as a group of people to follow today, do you suggest what as a good um, translator? Yes, I, I think that uh, so, so Edward Wallace Budge is the best. Uh, translator in the English language that we would have in any of these ancient works. As you know, the, he was the, the um, director of the university of the, in the museum in London uh, until his death. Uh, so that I suggest that, but you will notice in a section in the Book of the Dead called Osarian Drama, that in that section, they have 42 basic laws and the 42 basic laws became the foundation of what is today called the Ten Commandments. Every one of the Ten Commandments you can find in the uh, 42 admonitions to Goddess Ma'at, plus the other 32 became the foundation upon which the ordinances are laid down, so that's the total 32. But nobody told us in school, whether it be in the church or whether it be in the in the day-to-day -day school, that the Ten Commandments has nothing at all to do with the Jews, that they copied it, the Christians copied it, the Muslims copied it, and then gave us warm over porridge, and we were going on all the time, begging that we had something new. But go right there when it's over, and you see the Ten Commandments plus the 32 other works which you thought had come from the Jews. Yes, sir. Could you give us or elaborate on the word Jew? Never use the word Jew. What no, what I use that colloquially, Abraham was the first Hebrew. Uh, he was born from Terah. Terah was his father, 
and they didn't elaborate on his mother, and therefore he became a Hebrew while he was allegedly, and I always say, you see, when we're talking about uh, Judaism in particular and many religions, and you're talking about the beginning of it, you're getting to uh, uh, mythology and allegory. Most of what is written there is not to believe word for word literally. It's allegorical. Because when you're talking about Adam and Eve, I don't think you're going there to believe that Adam was a man, Eve was a woman, and therefore this. You know, you got to take that with a grain of salt because who's going to prove it? Who's been there? You're talking about belief as against reality. And they're expecting you to, the writers, uh, there's nobody to prove this. Your belief against mine, against the next person's belief. Now, using that, Judaism, or Yehuda, uh, Y-E-H-U-D-A, is one of the tribes of the Hebrews. The English word for Yehuda is Judah. The colloquial expression for Judah is Jew. And that's how we get it. So the Jew, the word Jew is one of the tribe of the Hebrew people. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure, son, I'll be glad to just ask me. I'll give you a card. Yes, sir. Uh, Luxor is the current name for what was originally called Waset. W A apostrophe S E T. Waset. Uh, after was set when the when the Greeks came and uh, eventually the students come and evaded the Egyptians in 332, uh, the year 332, which was the 31st dynasty, uh, and they came all the way down to what was was set. Uh, the was set was being used up to until those time as it was the capital of the country, and it was equally the head of the Grand Lodge. And may I remind you that by 332, Waset was very old to the point that it had been conquered by the Greeks. But in the days when it was, for instance, it was the capital of Akhenaten before he changed it and went to um, uh, uh, the city of uh, where they did the, the special artwork. Uh, uh, it's the tongue of Akhenaten, but it's a different name, and I'll catch it, remember it, before I finish. And when he went there, uh, it was the capital under which um, Akhenaten did much of his rule. It was Rab where uh, uh, Ramesses II uh, did most of his work relating to his uh, uh, activities in wars against different states. It, it was the uh, council. When you come to, to uh, Waset or Luxor, uh, Luxor is called the city of th thousands of windows. Uh, when you come there, you would notice that it was occupied by over 40 different pharaohs and queens, and each of them established something that relate to them personally. For example, two and a half miles from Waset, is, uh, is Karnak. Karnak, you, you heard of temples. If you take St. Patrick's Cathedral downtown, you take St. John Divine up here on 110th Street, you take the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and you take the one in England, 
put them together, you could still run the Indy 500 around them. <laughs> That's literally. You go there and you could go down for as far as you could see. You would see that that is the temple. Temples within the temple. And got its own swimming lake for the priests. <coughs> and that, that's why I said, if you go one time here and you had the belief that I didn't have much, you would lose it immediately. You would come back stepping on grass in the air. I said, it's a, you will swell with pride in yourself. You would go and look at the Colosseum. You would look at, uh, in, 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 you know, I used to have a, one time, and uh, I've been carrying trips since 1945, and I used to go to Italy uh, uh, and the capital outside of uh, the capital of uh, Greece, uh, and then come to uh, yeah, Athens, and then come to, um, to, to Egypt, just so they could see what happened. Just there so they could see how the European copied the African and then bring the people back. And now I figure it's a waste of time going there anyhow. Uh, so I say you could always buy a postcard and see it. Yes, sir. Next. Next. I, I have not made myself equipped enough to be a, uh, a professor on the attitude of the, or activities of the Illuminati, and I, I don't know them that well. Uh, and I think that if some, and for me to speak on something, I got to know it well, intricately, in and out. So I'm, I feel very incompetent to deal with the, uh, Illuminati as against Freemasonry. I never give it the type of attention that it should have had. Uh, the, yourself and then the next. Up, the, up there and then down here. Well, I don't know of Jesus with Masonry. I take the, la the last point first. Of course, they have imp imposed that because of the 30... You see, what Masons in many lands have done is to make it to suit everything. And it doesn't suit everything. And I don't see how somebody can bring it and show in Jesus as a Mason. I don't know. I thought that I've read enough about, uh, uh, about uh, the Christian religion from different aspects of it in my comparative religion. I studied with it too but there's no record of. And uh, I want that to be careful that anybody could, know what, nobody can attach Christianity to, 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 to uh, Jesus because it is thousands of years before there is the figure called Jesus. Now about Ramesses II, uh, Ramesses II, the son of Seti I. Uh, Seti I was then the pharaoh at Luxor, what is called Luxor, was it? When he, when Ramesses got young and was the prince, he moved Ramesses to the temple at, uh, at the world's first known holy land. You know, people talk about holy land. The holy land down at the temple of Setaiwan was the holy land of the world. There was no other holy land yet. There was no Jerusalem, there was no Bethlehem, and certainly there was no uh, uh, place in Arabia, um, Mecca. And there was this holy land, by the way the holy land is closed now for repair, uh, and it was there that Ramesses was introduced to his family uh, his family tree, so to speak, the listing of the names uh, by Setaiwan, his father. It was there that he was carried through to the throwing of the bull. 
Uh, I know that throwing up the bull may be something that some brothers are familiar with, but I don't mean that kind. Uh, they were, what, uh, the Pharaoh had to throw the bull every 10 years, and his son was <laughs> taught how to throw the bull. And it was there that the, as I said, the, four, the first, and we don't speak of it, we speak as if when we go into Bethlehem, as if when we go into Jerusalem, or when we go into Mecca, we go into the Holy Land. But forget that there's a Holy Land still there in Africa thousands of years before those others existed. And that what we got as Holy Land and I think are copies from what the Africans did. The sad thing is that we belittle what we have done and we adopt everything others have done. And that is the sad part, is that we forget what we have done for the benefit of what others have told us. The gentleman. We got problems. The one that I know that the ancient Egyptians, see, I'm one of the Egyptologists who, if I am going to put a theory, I tell you it's a theory in advance. I don't have any theory of my own about the pyramids. What the ancient has done is built pyramids for the king, and for the queen from the third dynasty until the 12th dynasty. The first pyramid was the one at Saqqara by Imhotep. The last one was of Amen Emat the third at Dongat the Fayum. Those would give us the 91 pyramids that were built by the ancients. In Egypt, of course, there are those that were built in Sudan, uh, 44 of them. And they were all built for one purpose, to bury the king or queen. And there is no pyramid having two people in them. So Hollywood could go on with the nonsense about when the pharaoh was dead, they killed the, the servants and put them in there with him. That's good for Hollywood, but it isn't good for reality. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, sir. religious document the Jews had. It preceded the five uh, books of Moses. Because you know if we are talking about Moses, we got to be talking about he supposedly had a fight with Ramesses II. And Ramesses II lived from, took over the throne of his father when his father died in 1291. And he succeeded until 1232, uh, a period of 67 years on the throne. Uh, so we will have to take that, and there wasn't a single book by Moses. You know, the, it, I, I like uh, this aspect of religion. We speak of the, six, the, the five books of Moses. Moses never wrote a word that we have. The five books of Moses is named for and in honor of Moses. But Moses was dead before the first word was written. It was published in 700 B.C., and Moses disappeared. Nobody knew where he went in 1650. And most people believe that Moses wrote something. <laughs> yes. The gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I hate to disappoint you. My father was an Ethiopian Jew. I am an Ethiopian Jew. I don't practice. Uh, your religion is as good as mine. Uh, whether you're, Judaism, you're, you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, your religion is as good as mine because I believe mine and you believe yours. None of us know if it's true. Now, now, uh, go in your Torah. And in the book of Exodus, it speaks that Moses married the daughter of the high priest of Ethiopia. It's in your book. If you're Muslim or you're Christian or you're Jewish, it's in there. So you don't need the people to say that about the teaching about that. I don't say it's right or wrong. I say what's in the book. <laughs> now, if Moses married the daughter of the high priest of Cush of Ethiopia, they had to have other people, a high priest, then you got other, other priests. If you got priests, you got congregations. If you got congregations, you got people. And that's during the time of Moses. So they didn't have to be going back and forth. I beg your pardon? But look, people are different things. Much, they, they better, and by the way, uh, not no, no harm on you. The word, we don't call ourselves falashas. Other Ethiopians call us falashas. Uh, for instance, when I was a boy, they called me chankala. You know what a chankala is? A chankala is an African. Because I don't look like a Amharan. I don't look like a Tigrano. I don't look like a Danakil. I look more like somebody on the border of Sudan or the border of Kenya. So then I became a Chankala. In other words, saying, you're an African. But what is he? An African. Now, <laughs> so uh, Palasha is the name that the Amharans, a group of Ethiopians, gave us. It means, don't touch me, funny looking, uh, uh, foreigners. That's what we call ourselves better Israel. Some people call us Falasha. We don't call ourselves Falasha. No, it makes me, when I used to practice, a Jew. Not original or not. Who knows about the original one? They said, Ab they said Abraham was the first one, and everybody sprang from him. I don't know my daddy having a contact with Abraham, and if he did, there weren't going to be no babies. <laughs> you see, it, all of us have a bad habit of trying to be, it, it, like people said, when you got anything here in Africa, about Africa, then you see a lot of people jump up and say, my mother and people were kings and queens. None of my family were kings and queens. They're talking about their family, not mine. My family was four old Africans doing some work someplace. They were no kings and queens. And so, so you got one of the poor African fellas running around here, just plain old joke. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes. I am not a special, they call them perimodalists. I am not a specialist on the construction there. Based upon what the statement is, they were primarily used for uh, committing um, uh, murder of, excuse me, sacrifices and so forth. Not one of the African pyramids are used for the same purpose. I don't say that they were not African pyramids or they are not. I don't know. And I haven't done. But Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, who is a specialist in that area, Leo, Leo Weiner from uh, the University, Harvard University, Das Casas, and many others who are specialists from different uh, university backgrounds in the area, uh, speak as if, of, of them of having a conne connection. When Sir Haidar, when he did his uh, experimental trip with a papyrus boat from Egypt all the way to Barbados in the Caribbean, uh, satisfied enough uh, uh, information relating to this, and he said that based upon that experiment that there's enough evidence to 
validate that they're the same group of people. He showed uh, the collection of coins in the Caribbeans and looking at the uh, findings of Pignafetto, when Pignafetto was there in the early part of the quote-unquote experiments to the, to the Americas, uh, he validate uh, them in his log of the ship. That's the best, but I personally am not, uh, that's not my specialty, so I refer you to Dr. Van Sertim, Sertima. Yeah, good name, sir. The Ark of the Covenant, you could see the exact copy. It is a copy of the confined one, the box of the confined one, that which the ancient Egyptian had. The Jews copied it uh, in every detail and made one of their own, but nobody can tell you where the Ark of the Covenant is. They do have a confined one in the museum in Cairo, and that's kept, uh, you can go there and view it, but it's kept uh, very well uh, in protection. Uh, they, they talk about one in Ethiopia, but nobody have ever seen it. And uh, they keep people ignorant like that, so you always look forward to it, but nobody have ever seen it. Uh, one more, one more, please. Uh, one more question, please. I beg you? That, that, yeah, three, that, three of me has right in the back, brother, with the announcement. <laughs> that uh, information is a little passe. There are 45 published books, and there are about that same amount of unpublished books. That means manuscript material. You could go to uh, Dr. Uh, Arthur Lewis, who's in the room with some books, and uh, besides him, some uh, uh, black bookstores and, and the, the big bookstore downtown, downtown um, uh, uh, this one that those textbooks for universities are, uh, anybody, uh, Barnes and Nobles. Barnes and Nobles, you can get uh, many of my books and so forth. Ah, yes, I think that book is still in print, and Dr. Lewis uh, can have it. I think it has, he has gotten from the publisher uh, about 200 new copies that were lurking around. Okay, okay. Hey, brother, hey, brother. Yeah, last, this is the last question, please. Thank you. What I want to know is, was it taught by Mason to the or was it a <clears throat> you know, Masons is a term that has been used quite frequently these days. But Masons were an unknown people in this respect. From man to man, you didn't know a Mason. A Mason didn't walk around the street and say, that's a Mason. Masons were people, that's what they call them secret, one secret, but they were people who did not advertise themselves. They didn't march in parades. They didn't carry signs. They, you know them by the way they live and the things they said. For instance, uh, when I go home, I don't walk around with rings. When a person sees me and he wants to know, he comes up next to me, say what he has to say. If I want, I, I, I respond. If I don't want, I don't respond. Most of the time, I don't respond because I realize that in Egypt, most of us are underground, what you call underground. It's, it's, we can come above ground according to what the government say, but we know from past experience, every time we come above ground, we have been glad to get back down underground. So, so, so only those of us who are known, for whatever the reason is, stay known. But the vast majority of us keep ourselves very much concealed, and uh, we are known we are known by our behavior and not by the uh, high visibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Thank you. At this time, sisters and brothers, it gives us great pleasure. We have also been graced 
by having in our midst also Dr. John Henry Clark. I don't know if he wants to say something or not. They asked me to say one word, and at 81, I'm just glad to be alive. Thank you. Have you got the picture? Yeah. <laughs> we, we have uh, sisters and brothers who travel from Brooklyn and throughout. Uh, we have with us from uh, Enoch Grand Lodge. Uh, is Grandmaster Butts in the house? 